Ladies and gentlemen, if you know anything about the game of chess, then you've probably seen Netflix's The Queen's Gambit. And if you have not seen The Queen's Gambit, you need to find the nearest mirror, walk up to it, and ask yourself what the hell you're even doing. The show inspired and cultivated millions of people around the world, but in particular, this video is about one scene. Here it is. Elizabeth Harmon's not at all an important player by their standards. The only unusual thing about her really is her sex. And even that's not unique in Russia. There's Nona Gaprindashvili, but she's the female world champion and has never faced men. Netflix, please do not sue me, fair use and all that. All right, cool. Anyway, that is from the final episode when Beth Harmon travels to the Moscow uh, Invitational Tournament and that clip mentions Nona Gaprindashvili. Nona Gaprindashvili is a trailblazer and she was the first woman to received the Grandmaster title. By 1968, she had played against many men already, apparently over 50 of them, and they say that she's from Russia. She is not, she is Georgian. Although, at the time, obviously, there is the Soviet Union. So Nona has sued Netflix for $5 million. We're gonna take a look at the lawsuit now. So a chess trailblazer is suing Netflix over her portrayal in The Queen's Gambit. Um, and uh, we will take a look at the report in a moment. Uh, Nona Caprindashvili has sued for defamation and invasion of privacy. Uh, and uh, the quote is here. The only unusual thing about her, right? We, we already took a look at this. Uh, and essentially what they're saying is that the statement in the show is false, sexist, belittling, uh, and uh, by 1968 when the show was set, you know, she had played against, wow, 59 male chess players. I thought it was over 50, it's almost 60, and she once played 28 of them uh, at the same time. She's seeking $5 million in damages, arguing that the false statement caused her personal humiliation, distress, anguish, uh, and as well as damages her profits and earnings, her ongoing capacity to engage in her professional livelihood in the world of chess. Uh, and it turns out um, that they had reached out prior. Uh, and uh, that, that, that shows up in some of these articles. We will take a look at the actual lawsuit. So this is the filing document. Now, one thing I will say is that if you go a little bit down the line, and right here, they, they list that, you know, the, the official claim that she's played 59 male players. One thing they say is that she played uh, Velimirovich, Gligorich, Keres, uh, Kuraitsa, and Vishwanathan Anand is mentioned. Now, Vishwanathan Anand was born in 1969, so if she had played him in 1968, that would have been incredibly impressive. So, this is a very clear mistake in the filing of a lawsuit. I hope this doesn't discard by technicality, and I also hope there are no other mistakes. But this was a glaring one that obviously she did not make, but somehow in the conversations with the lawyers was made. So, yeah, I mean, I hope that this wasn't like a wishy-washy uh, filed attempt by the, by, the, by the team, because otherwise, you know, people are going to see that and go, oh my god, what, what the... Right, so mistakes happen, but it's a legal filing, so I don't know. So to me, a couple of absolutely fascinating things about this case. First of all, how the hell did all of us miss this? Am I the only one who missed the boat on this? How did all of us miss this? No one batted an eye. I just watched the whole show like months, months, months ago. I was like, oh, great show. I didn't even, I didn't even, didn't even think about it. Um, now here it is, I'm like, wow, that's completely incorrect. For the sake of being legitimate, um, they tried to use a real person, right? So they, they mentioned Nona Gaprindashvili, uh, even though it's a show about a fictional character. Uh, and they completely incorrectly stated Nona's accomplishments uh, and, you know, it, it, she's suing for defamation and, and accordingly. So I'm not a lawyer and I'm not going to pretend to be one. Um, I'm all for her suing. Uh, and the lawsuit clearly states that they tried to reach out and Netflix was like, it's not a big deal. And she's like, yeah, it's totally a big deal. How is it not a big deal? Uh, so... By all means, uh, you know, screw the corporations, uh, file your lawsuit. Now, what I don't understand is uh, where is going to be this meeting ground? Uh, on the one hand, they can just completely pull the line out of the show and just put the show like nothing happened. So I don't exactly know what her payout is going to be. Uh, feel free to discuss in the comments. And rather than focusing on the negatives at all in this video, I would like to highlight Nona Gaprindashvili's chess career. Besides becoming the first woman to receive the Grandmaster title, she was the women's world champion for 16 years. She competed and won so many top tournaments. Uh, she was part of the Soviet women's team, which dominated the Olympiad. I think she won 25 medals, 11 team golds, 
nine or 10 individual gold medals. She played one Olympiad. She played 10 games in that Olympiad. She went undefeated. She she won all 10 games. In Tbilisi, Georgia, hopefully I'm pronouncing that correctly, the chess palace is dedicated to her. There is a perfume uh, named Nona, which is dedicated to her. Um, I mean, she is a beloved icon in the country of Georgia, and she has inspired tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands, if not millions of people to play chess. So I'm going to show you two games from pivotal moments in her chess career. One of them is from the final round of the 1962 Women's World Championship match, and one of them is from 1977, where she played in the Lone Pine Tournament and qualified for a Grandmaster Norm by tying first through fourth place. She played two other tournaments around that time where she was half a point short, but her dominant performance at Lone Pine in such a, a trailblazing moment uh, had Fide look at her results and say, you know what, she is deserving of the Grandmaster title. Let's get into the games. The first game I'd like to show you is from 1962. This is the final round of the Women's World Championship match. Nona Gaprindishvili with the white pieces now officially at this point not yet a Grandmaster. She received it in uh, 1978, but out of respect, uh, I am going to uh, I'm going to keep the Grandmaster title there. Also the country of Georgia, right? The Georgian flag not yet recognized in 1978. Also, uh, Elizaveta Bykova, her opponent. Uh, there's no such thing as Russia in 1962. So a lot of things can be corrected here. Please don't complain. Uh, if Nona wins this game, she becomes the world champion. So 93-96. This against the Sicilian is something known as the Grand Prix attack. At the time of recording this particular clip, I do not have a video just yet, but a lot of people have requested it. Um, and uh, it's a very aggressive way to play against the, uh, the Sicilian defense. And uh, Bukova plays a critical line. She actually attacks the center immediately with e6, d5. The alternative here by black is to play d6, not really fight for anything just yet around this triangle, but normally to play a6, b5, and b4. So black will create counterplay on the queen side with that plan, but here just going for e6 and d5. Bishop b5, this allows white to get a little bit of a lead in development. Now white has two knights and a bishop out, and black is a little bit passive, but White at some point is going to have to clarify what's going on. So Nona takes on d5. She can castle. She can play queen e2. She can play d4 or d3. She chooses to go knight e5. Theory has proven that black is completely fine here, but the year is 1962 at the time of this game. So uh, there's no such thing as theory uh, just yet. I mean, in, in this kind of a position. And we have bishop to e7. And now it's time for white to sort of uh, step up. Like white gave away the bishop, right? White doesn't have the light squared bishop anymore. Uh, so now what? Uh, is really the question. How is white going to try to create some kind of initiative here? So white plays queen f3, attacking the pawn on d5. Black could jump into d4, and after something like queen d5, just lose the pawn and hang out and maybe take on c2 in the future. Black chooses to defend right away, but this allows a quick capture, and now f5. And ladies and gentlemen, I want you to take a mental snapshot of this bishop, because as it retreats back, the rest of the game, it, it doesn't really participate, okay? Now, if I ask you a question here, what is the best plan for white? What is the best plan for white? Okay, that doesn't really give us a whole lot. Castles, all right. That also doesn't really give us a whole lot. Now, if you're looking at this, you're going to say, well, obviously, I'm going to go here and then here and then some sort of mate in the future and bang, bang, bang. Yeah, the problem is if you play queen g3 with the idea to play bishop h6, let's just say I, I even let you play bishop h6, I just go here. You will not mate me. It's impossible. So you need to play on the pawn structure. What does that mean? Well, doubled c pawns, the knight jumps to a4 to pressure them, and then you build up around so the pawn can't come forward, and you just apply as much pressure as possible. Ideally, you can get this pawn to come forward so that you can even rotate your knight to c4. Let's see how she does it. She plays b3 and d3 because now she has one, two, three, four, five, six. Six of her seven pawns are on light squares to counteract that dumb bishop, right? Now, rook d1. If you get this, then this bishop is out of the game and this bishop very much does become an attacking piece. So rook to e8, knight a4, and slowly but surely, this is going to get rounded up. Rook e1, and now after queen d6, bishop e3, here's our moment. Black has committed to playing the move d4, so we go back to g1 so that h2 cannot be taken, and this knight has served its purpose. We've made one pawn come forward, so it's time to reroute the knight. 
right? And then it'll go to c4. And now white has a dominant positional advantage because you've put all your pawns, you haven't even touched your pawns in a while. You've made black come forward. This structure is now completely frozen. Anytime a doubled pawn escorts a pawn forward, the doubled pawns get left behind. This pawn's not gonna go anywhere. And uh, now we take the positional advantage that we have and we try to either create an attack because we're so dominant positionally, or we just try to completely cash in. So c3, I'll cash in on the positional element, right? C3 is a big problem because if you take on C3, you now triple your pawns. They will all get taken in the future. So black can't really do that, right? I'm not really sure black has a choice. Takes, takes, takes. Now what black tries to do here is give back one of the pawns and maybe allow white to block their own queen. Even if that were to happen, white is still winning here. Uh, but white decides to take over here and go to D6 and just go after that bishop, that really dumb bishop. Uh, finally, like 20 moves later, the bishop moves to e8, which is just utterly depressing. Uh, and now b4. b4 is just a nice move. The queen glues everything together. And so how, how does white win now? Like, okay, we, we have this big advantage. So how does Nona break through in this position? White is only a pawn up, but the, but the advantage is like plus 3.5. It's completely winning. So first we go to b8. Rook slides over. We got to get the queen out of danger. And we say, all right, bishop d4. Let's put some pressure on g7. Let's move the bishop out of danger, guard the bishop. Now f6 is a bit of a problem here. So black plays rook back to b7 to defend g7, but f6 comes right in. Queen f7, now white is up two pawns. And how is, okay, white gave that pawn back. Notice how all of white's important stuff is on dark squares. I understand this rook is not, but the rook can always go to e1, which it's about to do in a second. Queen e5. And uh, rook d8 is coming, or rook f1, rook f8 is coming. So now black has to sacrifice on g7, and uh, we clean up. This is a totally winning endgame. You get the pawn, and you win this by advancing your king and your rook and your pawns forward. Self-explanatory. Uh, Nona chooses, by the way, it's a very fancy move. Bishop takes g2, would run into rook g5, right? So can't do that. And you'll actually notice she does it by just moving one pawn. She brings the king all the way and plays g4. And black resigns here because what you're going to do is sacrifice. So you can't always do this, but in this case you can because you have two pass pawns and that's going to be the end of the game. And with this win, uh, as a young 21, 22-year-old, uh, Nolika Prindashvili became uh, the women's world champion. And she held on to that title for quite some time, nearly two decades. Uh, the next game I want to show you, this is the final round of the 1977 Lone Pine Tournament. I mentioned it in, in the introduction. She's playing an international master, Jack Peters from the United States, uh, who back then actually went by John Peters, uh, but Jack Peters. And this time she plays Open Sicilian. So we fast forward 15 years. She's now uh, well adapted in the, uh, in the Open Sicilian lines. And oftentimes to beat the best players, you actually do have to go into the main lines. That's just, you can't beat around the bush. You got to go into the main lines. Now, this begins with a four knight Sicilian in the Taimana variation, but actually becomes uh, with Bishop F4, E5, a Sveshnikov Sicilian. You say, Levy, what are you talking about? Well, watch. You keep this position in mind, right? This is the beauty of move order. Uh, instead of e6, watch. Boom, 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 boom. Knight c3, and then here e5, and then this position with bishop to g5, right? Now watch this. Nothing's happened, right? Nothing changed. I clicked the other variation. It's the same thing. Ha! <laughs> Magic. Didn't, you came here for a lawsuit video and some game analysis, and instead what you get, you got magic. Now... This position has been reached before many, many times. And after f5, uh, there's a lot of theory here. Like, just so, so, so much theory. Normally, what white wants to do is figure out whether they're going to play c3 to prevent b4 and then rotate the knight, or c4 to force b4 and rotate the knight. And theory has proven both of these things to be completely sufficient. Black oftentimes might get some counterplay on this side of the board. Uh, and also, we, we do have to keep in mind that there are many lines nowadays where rather than playing b5 and getting hit with bishop takes f6, uh, black will actually uh, sometimes even put a, a, a bishop on e7 first and take like that. That is something that does happen. Uh, but in this case, we have the double g pawns and we have this line. Nona gives away the pawn on e4 uh, and plays bishop g2 and takes it back. 
Bishop g7, queen h5, and here Jack Peters does not blunder checkmate in one move. He is not submitting a game for guess the elo. Uh, rather, he plays rook to c8, looking to create queenside counterplay. Short castle by white, knight to e7, looking to trade the knight off. And the entire advantage of white's position is the fact that the d5 square is, is won. So what does that mean? That means that if you win the battle for the d5 square, like you just cannot be booted from there, even at the cost of something like the c2 pawn, oh, well, actually, that's defended, uh, but I'm actually going to keep this in anyway because I just made a total fool of myself. Let's just say rook c2 was possible, and for some reason you would not be able to take back. Jesus. Queen g4 attacks the bishop, rook d1, rook d6. This is all going to get won. You're completely busted. And let's just put this knight on f5. All right, yes, did I just spend 20 seconds analyzing a position where a rook can be taken in one move? Absolutely. But I want you to just see that I also do make mistakes. Holy crap, rook takes c2. Why would I ever even suggest that? You have to win the battle for the d5 square because otherwise black will just roll you with the pawns and play short castle. So, rook to c5. Knight to e3. The problem here is that black now gets really dynamic play. Black has won the battle for the d5 square by playing the move d5, but it's going to be total pandemonium and no more rooks will be hung. b4. The rook is under attack, so the rook's got to go. c. Oh my god. If take, take, then we take the queen. What about bc4? If bc4... Whoa! Whoa! <laughs> what? What? What is going on? So the reason why Nona is able to make these breaks is because Black's king is in the middle. Like for example, if I edit f3, castles f4, this is completely lost for Black, uh, sorry, uh, for White because f5. Like Black is just up material, everything in the center is completely closed and, and, and tied and defended. You're not gonna break through. I mean, even if you get to take on d5, boom, Boom and boom, and that doesn't work, right? You, you just, you, okay, so what, fantastic. So, so, the reason why f4 works is there's no f5. And if black castles now, well then you play queen h7 mate. Did you forget? So you can't castle, so what the hell are you gonna do? This is what you're gonna do. Queen b8, that's an exotic move. If you take, f, taking on f4 might have been best, but then, because that pawn moves, the queen now sees the pawn. If you watched, uh, my video called seven most common chess mistakes you would know that every time a move happens in a, in a position you need to look at what pieces open up left right and diagonal that's also in my intermediate boot camp described in a bit more of a professional way queen to b8 is a fascinating move because you sidestep this and you hit the pawn on b4 uh, white now has one and only one move to get advantage it's f5 and it attacks the bishop even though this bishop is hanging over here uh, because again the problem is the king is in the middle Queen to b6, and now you got you got to get this knight back. So it defends the pawn and defends the knight, and this bishop and this bishop are still completely hanging. Not to mention f6 is a fork of a knight and a bishop. So pawn takes. All right, that wasn't complicated. And now if queen e6 were to have been played, there would have been an absolutely savage move. Feel free to pause the video here and try to find it. I'll give you five seconds. Four, three, just kidding. Rook takes f7. Queen f7. Kabam! You say, Levy, I don't get it. You gave away two rooks for a queen. Again, the problem is the king is in the middle, and because of that, the pieces never got out. So white, white is just dominating here. White is going to pick up a couple of these. And the good thing for white is white's got the horses in the back. Literally, by the way. Uh, because if you trade off a few pieces, actually, the queen is not so powerful. The queen does need a little bit of help. Castles, though, is played. And Jack Peters must have been like, yo, my king's out of danger. My rook and bishop are in the game. This is exactly what I want. Now I'm going to start flying down the middle of the board. The problem is it's white's move. And white has the ultra killer move. King to g2. You say, Levy, I don't understand what the hell the point of that move is. Well, you unpin yourself. And now that you've unpinned yourself, the rest of the dominoes are about to fall in black's position. Black plays queen e6, looking for f7. The absolutely cold-blooded queen trade offer. See, Nona doesn't trade queens like you trade queens. Well, I need to trade queens or else I'll get scholars mated. No, she's a little bit better than that. She'll go at least five or six moves. And she's, uh, she's already on move 27, so she's doing quite all right. You gotta trade the queens here because even though the structure is all over the place, white clearly has the advantage because in all end games, it comes down to peace activity and weaknesses. And you're not really gonna tell me that these pawns really leave an impression. I mean, we got three bozos standing in the center of the board that are all tying their shoes together, okay? Knight to c6, rook d6, infiltrate. Now we have 
Knight back to b8, time to use the two on one. We still have a queenside majority because the c pawn is a little bit too far. Rook c8, now rook e6, poking at a6, poking at the e pawns, and potentially going down to e8. Very nice. Knight d7, knight d5 attacks the rook, the rook moves. Fork! Boom! Check here. Okay, we've escaped the fork, but now the new layer of attack comes through, threatening rook d7, rook f8, and the game is over. So black has to play rook f6. And now we come right back, and now we do have a fork, and this fork is going to hurt. You say, why didn't she take the rook? Well, then she would have lost her own rook. And you say, what about knight e6? Potentially, yes. But she, did, she probably didn't like that she was going to lose the c2 knight. So what she's doing is she's doing a totally risk-free approach here. Rook c6. The problem is that with this risk-free approach, black is still kind of hanging around. Maybe going to sack the rook for the two knights or something. She says, go ahead. Go ahead. Take it. Take my knight. She's like, no, I'm going to go for the pawn. All right, great. Now I get, on, now I get c3. And once I get c3, I'm going to get everything else. Now I get the rook. You take. I got to slide out of there. Rook b2 check. King slides back to f1. King e6. Knight c7 attacks the rook. Uh, sorry, attacks the king. Now we go rook h8. So we're still hunting. We're still hunting the pawns. The constant threat of the b pawn promoting is there, so you need to defend it. But black, black is actually not completely, like, it's not hopeless. Knight f8, where every piece in white's position is doing something. Like, every single piece. Okay, maybe not the h2 pawn, but that's defending g3, so we're fine. Bishop to a3. Now knight to d5 check. King slides over to f7. Check here, rook a7. Bishop's got a difficult decision. Where does it go? It chooses not to move at all. Rook takes a3. Knight to e6. And now rook takes h7. Leaving us in an endgame of double d pawns versus g and h. And knight g5. We have to give this check. The king slides out. Got to give this check. King slides over here. Now... She might sacrifice to get the winning rook endgame. Is she going to? Wow, how did I know that? Because this is just over. This is game over. That's the easiest way. Now, endurance is really important at these events. I mean, this is move 60. So she's had the endurance. She's persevered. She did not blunder checkmate on king f3, rook b1. And now, easy peasy, cruising to the finish line. And this game propelled her to her finish of a tie for first place, first through fourth place, and ultimately the awarding of that Grandmaster title by FIDE. So I hope you enjoyed this video. I wanted to share the story with all of you. Uh, and, you know, we're all sitting back and rejoicing as the Queen's Gambit completely swept across the world. But all of us somehow missed this. And the original pioneer of women's chess was slighted twice, two times in the final episode of the show. Uh, so listen, I hope they find a way to rectify the situation. I hope she gets something. I hope she uh, she can win at least a little bit more than them just axing the line from the show and pretending like it never happened. So go Nona, and I hope this video introduced you to a new chess player you might have not seen before. Uh, and uh, hopefully it was you know hopefully it was an enjoyable experience. Hopefully this this too shall pass and life goes on. Поживем увидим, as they say in Russian. Peace out, y'all. I'll see you in the next video.